Episode 14, Clip 1, Colonizing Mars and the Trump-Musk Feud. All right, the gateway to Mars. So here we are. Here we are at, at the newly incorporated Starbase, Texas. This is the first new city made in America in, I think, quite a few decades. That, at least that's what I'm told. And a very cool name. And it's named that because it is, the, it is where we're going to develop the technology necessary to take humanity and civilization and life as we know it to another planet for the first time in the four and a half billion year history of Earth. It comes back in about five or six minutes, one way or another, and then it gets caught by the tower arms, placed back in the launch mount, and then you can re refill for propellant in about 30 to 40 minutes and place a ship on top of it and, in principle, refly the entire booster every hour. Transfer how you do orbital transfer from Earth to Mars. And if you look on your Starlink Wi-Fi router, you'll see this image. Because the Starlink Wi-Fi is what is, or Starlink Internet is what's being used to pay for humanity getting to Mars, or the landing pads, just in case. But for Mars, we're going to need a lot of solar power. We'll be, since you, you can't really walk around on the surface of Mars, at least as yet, until Mars is terraformed to be like Earth. Yeah, so that really is the grand vision, is to basically have a sister planet that could support life. And eventually, and this is hundreds of years out, is terraform it, which means you make even the outdoor environment livable for humans. At the beginning, you'll be stuck in caves or in buildings the entire time, or in suits, or in vehicles. But over time, it can really develop. And what's notable about this is, like, unlike going to the moon, which was just part of a race an achievement to achieve to beat the Soviets at, this really is much more holistic. The idea is to to have an entire colony of at least a million people who live there. And basically, the key is that they have to be self-supporting so that even if something happens on Earth and Earth can no longer send supply ships, they can develop or build or grow whatever they need to continue surviving. So that way, life and consciousness has a backup. Whether it's a nuclear World War Three or it, some pandemic that you know is, has an extremely contagion and extremely deadly and kills off most of the planet, or it could be an asteroid hitting, right? It's just a matter of time until the sun expands and envelops all of Earth, and basically life isn't ha inhabitable here anymore. So that's a very long time out, but it is just a matter of time. So if we do want to make sure that life, civilization, and maybe humanity have a path forward. And it should be multiple types of life, life of all types, bacteria and animals and creatures and bugs and everything, because you need an ecosystem. But hopefully we will have that on Mars. And that is a it's a very inspirational and exciting thing, don't you think? I think it is. And ultimately, these aren't things that everybody in their day to day lives hear about. So it's interesting when we put it out there that this is happening behind the scenes. And whether you believe in it, whether you think it's realistic, whether you think it's going to be fraught with all kinds of problems, that those are other discussions, but this is moving forward. And there's a lot of energy, time and effort being put into having a means to colonize at this point, Mars. And there's wasn't discussed here, but there's talk of being able to set up operations on the moon and for the various reasons that that would be helpful. And as all of these things proceed, it's, it'll be interesting to see just how the U.S. fares with, as opposed to other countries that are trying to do their projects to explore space. And there, one of the things that was actually in the news recently had to do with, with Jared Isaacman and the importance of who we're going to put in the seat to essentially direct NASA and FAA. These organizations all play important roles not just of what's happening on our planet, but what's going to happen beyond our planet. Yeah, Jared is, is truly an inspirational figure. When he was 16 in his parents' basement, basically he started a payment processing company called Shift4, and now they basically process all payments for almost every hotel in the U.S. and many other resorts and hospitals and restaurants and stuff like that. So he became a multi-billionaire, self-made, completely self-made on his own, starting from age zero, almost age 16. But then he got bored after a few years and he said, okay, like you did, Joe, he said, let me follow my passion and learn to fly and did get his pilot's license and he learned to fly. And he started buying propeller planes and then he started buying jet planes and he said, wait, maybe I can help. It's hard to buy used F-15s or F-16s. It's pretty easy to buy used Sequoias, right? Or MiGs. 
which are the Russian jets. So he started buying them and he said, wait, maybe we can do something beneficial with this that would be beneficial for the US military as well. And he started a company called Kraken where they basically dogfight the US military. Nowadays they have, I think, FA-18s as well. And so he's this crazy fighter pilot Again, he never served in the military, but he dogfighted the military and he built this company that that is very professional at dogfighting Western militaries. And that's truly a, a inspirational. Becoming a, a fighter jet pilot has always been a, a dream of mine, and I haven't even become a regular pilot like you have, a personal pilot. And then from there on, he said, wait, why only fly on Earth if you can leave orbit? And he happened to know somebody from SpaceX who like jokingly basically mentioned there was recently an, a phenomenal episode with Jared Isaacman on the All In podcast. I recommend that everybody listen to that with Dave. And he was like, even though he didn't really have any relationship with Elon, he was invited to be the commander of the first all civilian inspiration for flight to outer space. And he did that successfully on the Dragon ship. And uh, yeah, they in the process, he was able to fundraise millions and millions of dollars for St. Jude's Hospital. He's fundraised for them in the past as well. And uh, yeah, and after that, he went on to do the first spacewalk on another space flight. He commanded to this to do the space, the first all civilian spacewalk in outer space. So truly an inspirational person. He probably would have been the best NASA administrator in possibly all of NASA's history, but unfortunately that got axed by someone in the Trump administration. Even though Trump gave him a lot of compliments in the past, suddenly he somebody changed Trump's mind on that. Laura Loomer really gives a, a good roundup of kind of what happened behind the scenes. And just worth noting that she wrote this before Trump's announcement, but I think you have that as well. So let's take a look. You can go ahead and read it. Yeah, I'm going to put it up. So this has two different things. One is Laura Loomer posting what she posted. And then later on, there was the president's post regarding his the administration's decision. So it says exclusive deep state operatives are trying to derail President Trump's NASA administrator pick, which is basically Jared Isaacman, before his Senate confirmation this week. Source, place source tells me that Jared Isaacman's nomination to be the next administrator of NASA was set for final Senate confirmation for early next week, but DC insiders are now trying to convince the White House to pull the plug on Isaacman before his confirmation vote. The final decision to pull Isaacman's nomination could come as soon as Monday. There is reason to believe that Isaacman may be facing retaliation because of his friendship with Elon Musk. If so, this would suggest there's a coordinated hit job on Isaacman in an effort to damage his ties between President Trump and Elon Musk before the 2026 midterms, even though the two of them just held an Oval Office meeting and press conference yesterday where the President of the United States praised Elon for his generosity, his work at Doge, and even gave Elon a key to the White House. But much as she predicted a statement by President Trump later was posted that said, after a thorough review of prior associations, I'm hereby withdrawing the nomination of Jared Isaacman to head, the, to head NASA. I will soon announce a new nominee who will be mission aligned and put America first in space. Thank you for your attention to this matter. And what he's alluding to was that the public information given on this had to do with supposedly Jared Isaacman's prior ties and donations to the Democrat Party. I don't know about ties. Yeah, I don't know about ties, but donations for sure. But that's not a big deal. Trump himself donated to Democrats for many years, and so did many in the administration. Right, RFK was a Democrat until basically a few months ago. Elon was a Democrat or and donated to Democrats. So that, I think, seems much more of an excuse. Like we saw later, this was the pretext with this explosion in the relationship between Elon and Trump. And this may have been part of the cause because Elon, obviously, given that he had worked with him through SpaceX and launching him to space a bunch of times, does know Jared Isaacman and does have a relationship with him and recommended him because he really would be phenomenal for the job. It seems like some of the deep state operatives, like Luma, Laura mentions, who we don't know who they are, but they seem to have gotten behind and tried to meddle this. And this did cause an explosion between the two of them that did turn sour pretty quickly, unfortunately. But even afterwards, even after the goodbye party, we can say, where Trump gave Elon the key to the White House, they 
Elon was very courteous and thankful for Trump and didn't say a bad word against Trump, but he did bash the big, beautiful bill, the BBB, a whole bunch of times. He said, either it can be big and beautiful, or it can be either it can be big and ugly or slim and beautiful, because if it is as at least as the, the, with the Senate, the OBM, I think the office of Bud budgetary management, if their prediction is correct, and it does add hugely trillions of dollars to the deficit, this would damage the American people. So he never criticized Trump, but he did criticize the bill. And then Trump was in the Oval Office and with with the Chancellor Mertz, the new Chancellor of Germany, and nobody, poor Mertz, he came all the way to the United States to talk about Ukraine and about Europe. And nobody will remember much of his visit because it basically exploded when a reporter asked asked Trump, hey, I, think, I don't remember the exact question, but what do you think about Elon basically shitting all over your big, beautiful bill? And Trump really went at it and he gave Elon a bunch of compliments first, but then he said, our relationship is over. It's past tense. It's done. And he emphasized that. And then unfortunately he doubled down on that saying that Elon is against the bill just because it was canceling the EV credits, even though Elon has been against these EV credits from before they were initiated by the Biden administration and has, has been against them all along. He just said that it's unfair if you only cancel EV credits, but you continue funding the oil industry for billions or hundreds of billions of dollars. And if you don't remove other ways, he was basically like, okay, remove the EV credits as long as you remove other ways from the bill too, but don't have this really fat bill. And I, in my opinion, it was a little bit of a mistake. They started jumping the gun and started attacking because that's when it really got personal. And then Elon, the, his biggest mistake was that he eluded that Trump may be a pedophile. We saw Elon allow his son X kind of hang around the president. So I, I seriously doubt that. Plus Trump, even though he was close with Epstein in the 90s, like most of the elite in New York were, he did help the prosecutors prosecute Epstein during the first trial. It, it may have just, Elon didn't lie. He just said, it seems like Trump is on the list and that's why that list has not been released. And I was wondering why the list hasn't been released yet. And this is a possible explanation. And it wouldn't be surprising if Trump is on the list, like we said, because they did rub it, shoulders and he was on his plane supposedly, but it doesn't mean that he was, he was involved in any of the more nefarious things. There's no evidence he went to the island or anything like that, but still that that kind of alluded to the fact that Trump may be involved with all of this. And that's when the all gloves came off and Trump said, oh, maybe we'll cancel all of your contracts. And Elon's like, okay, no problem. Go for it. I'll go ahead and I'll decommission the dragon myself, which they didn't do, thankfully. And that was, I right away said that wouldn't happen because it was unrealistic. SpaceX doesn't have a replacement for that yet. But yeah, basically it got really brutal and ugly really quickly. And it's really sad. I think the only losers in this feud are the American people. And I hope that these two great men will be able to make up and make up with each other because it is damaging for us all. And we really need this, the community uh, continued partnership between the administration and Elon's companies. The pr prior administration tried to do everything possible to attack Elon and his companies. And they did with ridiculous lawsuits and ridiculous procedural things we have discussed in the past. So obviously we don't want to see this now. And even though most in the admi administration seem to admire Elon, they obviously all took towed the line and took Trump's side because Trump does not like anybody who stabs him in his back. So if anybody would turn and openly at least support Elon, then Trump would probably kick them out really quickly. So yeah, this was like a big division. The Democrats are partying, that's for sure. Don't you think? I think, and my stance on this, I think Elon acted in a manner which was unbecoming of him and it took him down a notch. That's the days later, looking back at this, that's what's happening. Be sure to watch our other clips and shorts and the entire episode 14 of the Yojo Show podcast and keep looking to the stars.